we are at a sad point in time here at this, at this verse. We're crying out. We're, we're lamenting. We're mourning. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? Oh, Jonathan, <coughs> thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. He's referring to a deep friendship there, nothing uh, vile. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perish? He's lamenting the loss of Saul and Jonathan, but mainly just the loss of Jonathan in battle. And I want to preach to you, won't be long at all. The title, When You Don't Handle Business. Let's pray. Lord, I love you, Jesus, and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for the word that you've laid on our heart. I pray that it stirs us to, to action, God. I pray that we answer that call, Lord. Minister in this house today, Lord, in your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> oh, you may want to go and say that. So for those that weren't out here for Sunday school, I made a, a statement that if you forget how, if one generation forgets how to war with the enemy, then the next generation never learns. And this is a direct result of that, so to speak, here. Because Jonathan was a, was a good person. Jonathan was a good man. The Bible doesn't say anything contrary to his nature. But it does speak contrary to his father, Saul. Saul started out on good terms with God and was chosen to be the first king of Israel and a mighty man of valor and did good in war. But Saul got lazy and just went crazy. Okay? He let it go to his head. And there were a couple different times that Jonathan actually had to fight the battle for Saul. Y'all might remember the story where Jonathan took his armor bear and climbed up the mountain and whipped the folks, just him and his armor bear, and it caused a great revival. Well, that kind of happened twice. <clears throat> twice Jonathan went and had to play the hero because his daddy was being lazy or coward and just not doing what he had to do. I'll let you know right now, that it's not, not the time to make an announcement, but I won't be here next week for Father's Day. My supervisor, supervisor saw fit to schedule a work trip on Father's Day. So I'm leaving Saturday and will be gone till Thursday. <coughs> so I won't be here for Father's Day and I had a thought that I wanted to share and that's what I'm doing right now. We've got plans. We're going to have church. We've got things in motion. We're going to work it out. So please be here. Uh, please don't take this as I'm 50. Oh, pastor's gone. I'm going to do something else. Please don't do that. But, so fathers, listen up. Boys, listen up. Because you'll be daddy one day. Everyone else, listen up. Because it still really applies to you. But Jonathan had to handle his daddy's business twice. And, and not just twice. At this time here, it finally caught up to him and cost him his life. Jonathan and Saul both died while fighting the Philistines. I'm not going to ask you out loud and wait for a response because I'll be embarrassed by the answer. But there is another famous biblical war with the Philistines that should come to your mind. When, as a matter of fact, when I mention Philistines, if you read the Bible enough, you should automatically think of Goliath. And when you think of Goliath, you think of Saul cowardly hiding and waiting for, I guess, Goliath to go away. But, so here was a valley, and you got two sides, Israel and Philistines. And the Philistines had their champion, who was big and bad, 
no one really knows exactly how tall he was, but he was a huge man. And he was insulting God and everybody who served him trying to provoke a fight. Because he, and I'll tell you what, it's just an intimidation. If that whole army of Israel would have came down at once, they would have ran right through that time. But they didn't have that faith. They were intimidated and they sat there shaking in their boots. David showed up. You know, you know the story. Used his lean, knocked him out, chopped his head off, and the Philistines ran. Saul did not take advantage of that opportunity. Had he taken control and killed the giant when he had a chance, he would have saved his son's life. I need the daddies to listen up. His son was killed because he did not handle business. And that happens more often than you think. When you don't take care of the enemies that you're supposed to take care of, they'll hang around long enough to take your children out. Saul was every bit as responsible for the death of Jonathan as the Philistines were. Because they shouldn't have been around. Saul had every opportunity to wipe them out. But because of his laziness, because of his cowardice, because of his pride, and all these things played a factor, now Jonathan, his beloved son, is dead on a battlefield. And that happens to us all the time. The exact same thing happens in the church. Because you won't quit drinking, your kids will learn to drink like you. Because you won't quit doing drugs, your kids are going to learn how to do drugs like you. The same enemy that you refuse to put down will destroy your children. We have to learn how to handle business. The generation that forgets how to war with the enemy, the next generation never learns. What you tolerate today will be embraced tomorrow. That's why we draw lines. That's why we have what we call standards. And I'm not just talking about clothes. I'm telling you, we have standards. No, this is wrong. That's wrong. We have to draw lines. Because what, when we don't draw a line, the enemy keeps moving closer. Legally speaking, a neighbor can take your land from you little by little if you don't stop them. It happens, especially in farms. The old story was shared and it's true. A farmer had his land here, the neighbor bought the land, and then one, one year the neighbor planted his crop just one row over into the farmer's side. Father said, what? Well, that's all right. You know what happened next year? Two rows. And if you, if, if you let him do it long enough, he's got a leg to stand on. And they're going to say, well, he, they don't give him the property. Eventually, you've got to stand there with your shotgun and say, my property. When? Are we going to stand there with our shotguns and tell the devil, my family, my kids, my church, my marriage? Why are we content on letting the devil take everything from us? Nehemiah 4 and 14 says, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, This is after the walls are destroyed and trying to build it back up. Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. I'm telling you, we have something to fight for. And when you don't fight for it, you give it up freely. I'm not giving up anything any longer. But I cannot fight alone. Where is the burden for d -whip? Where is the burden for these empty pews? Where is the burden for the people who used to go here? And I'm not talking about the ones that now go somewhere else. I'm talking about the ones that are now staying at home. Where is your burden for those that just no longer had that desire to be in the house of God? 
You need to care. It needs to hurt your heart. Because the enemy that you don't kill today will come back later and destroy your family. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Oh, just don't be short today. Where's your burden? Where's your realization? These precious babies. Do you know how precious that is? Thank you, Frankie, for the gift that, that helped them finally go to the camp. What an investment. But it'll be for nothing if we don't keep fighting for them. For every kid that was at camp this year, I can show you ten more that were there over ten years ago that's not there now. We lose more than we keep. And that's not okay. It's not okay to say, well, as long as I'm still in church. I know that there's something to be said about being thankful for what you have. But there needs to be desire to not lose anything else. You want to see something sad, go through our Facebook page. Go through all the pictures and just see all the people that are no longer sitting on our feet. And look at those moments and how happy we were. How excited we were. And think about the, thing, the testimonies that were made. Oh, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we still may eventually, but right now we're not doing it. Whatever that devil is in your life, if it's pride, you better deal with it. If it's a comfort zone, you better come out of it. If you don't teach your kids how to worship, they'll never learn. If you don't make it a priority to be in church, then don't expect them to make it a priority. If you don't teach them how to fight that devil, then you might as well get the funeral ready. And I refuse to go ahead and pre-plan pre our spiritual funeral. Because I want to, I want to take everyone here with me to heaven. The Bible says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the time of the church. And I told you before, what if that's not referring to a defensive posture? What if it's not referring to the church with its fists up and during the blow? What if it's the opposite? What if that's referring to the gates of hell not prevailing against the attack of the church getting back its family members that have fallen? Hasn't hell had your city long enough? Hasn't hell had, had your marriage long enough? It's time that we fight that devil. Quit waiting for things to just magically get better. Be aggressive. Pray fast. Make a change. Do things differently. And watch what God can do with that activity. Every head bowed and all eyes closed. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. 